Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Praise God. Father, we bless you tonight. We praise you. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. We give you reverence. For you are worthy of praise. We thank you for the privilege of gathering and coming together in this place, in this city, in this state of Alabama, in this great country. We thank you for liberty and freedom and justice for all in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he hath done and provided for us through the great plan of redemption. We give you praise for Jesus. Thank you for all of the exceeding great and precious promises that he made available by his blood. Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit whom you sent to be our teacher and our guide. He's here tonight. He's amongst us. He's upon me for the endowment of power to stand in the office of ministry. He is on the inside of us as our teacher and guide to help lead us and guide us into all truth tonight. And we thank you for hearing ears, seeing eyes, and hearts of a quick understanding. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Praise God. Well, hallelujah. We want to welcome all of you out there who are just tuning in on our YouTube channel and Facebook Live. Thank you for sharing this time with us. We're not here for any type of entertainment. It takes money and effort to make this available to you wherever you are so that you can hear the gospel. Jesus said the gospel must be spread. It must go into all the earth as a witness. Now, he didn't say everybody would get saved, but he desires that everybody hear and have the opportunity to be saved, to be healed, to be filled with the Spirit. Amen. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, you do your part by sharing uh, this with a friend uh, on your Facebook page. And also, you can do your part by taking part in the giving part of the service. The gospel is free. Amen. Jesus bought and paid for it all. But we live in a world of economy and economics, the law of supply and demand, the laws of giving and receiving. It takes finances to produce the gospel on any platform from a local church to social media to satellite dishes. It costs money to get this free gospel out to the nations of the world. And so we're going to be receiving an offering at the end of our service like we do every, every Sunday. And you can participate in that part of the service. There's three primary ways to give. You can always mail your offerings in to Anthony Strauder, P.O. Box 160-683, Amen, Mobile, Alabama, 36616. Or you can go online, anthonystrauder.com, and click where it says donate. It's on the front page of our website and give online. Many partners and many people give online. We do not operate this ministry solely on the people that are present here. We have people across states and other, other parts of the country, different states, different regions of this country that sow into this ministry and make this gospel available to you. Amen. And then last but not least, you can text your offering in to give. Uh, many of our partners participate in giving through or by way of text. So we thank God for whatever past, whatever present, and whatever future financial support that you give, you are making it happen. Thank you, partners, for being our partners. We love you. We, we passionately pray for you. I call your name upon every remembrance of you. And we get many letters and uh, phone calls and texts and, uh, uh, from our partners uh, stating their need. Many of our partners have had um, hospital surgeries and different physical challenges. And uh, we couldn't be there physically, but we've been there just right there with them spiritually to pray them out of a hard time and support them. So thank you, partners. You are making it happen. Amen. Praise God. Well, amen. I want to welcome you tonight to hear and be healed. Now, this part of the service is uh, edited for television time. 
and we're going to be preaching, we're going to be teaching the Word of God concerning healing belongs to us. Healing belongs to everybody, save and sinner alike, save or unsaved. Jesus bought and paid for your salvation. Jesus bought and paid for your healing. Amen. But it's up to you. You have to hear about it through the preaching of the gospel, and then you have to believe it and receive it, and it's yours to the taking. You can take your healing now, tonight, wherever you are, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Well, you may be seated in the congregation. <coughs> Amen. Now, open your Bibles with me tonight to Acts the 10th chapter, the 38th verse. And I want to read this verse of scripture. I want to wait on you to find it before we put it on the screen. I want to wait on the television audience to engage because I, this verse is so important. Uh, this is a foundational verse for what we're going to be teaching and preaching tonight. Amen. We're talking about where does sickness come from. And this verse is very revealing as to where it comes from. This is a major verse in the Bible. You want to know this verse, highlight this verse, mark this verse, study this verse for yourself, and God can give you further revelation than even uh, we can share tonight with the time we have. Amen. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Go ahead. Now let's read it. It says, How God anointed... Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that was oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Praise God. Amen. Let's read it again. Let's put it back on the screen. Let's read it again. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that was oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Amen. Now, again, I like to say in review that the first thing that I notice in this verse, that there were the whole trinity listed. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Now, we call it the Trinity, but the word Trinity is not in the Bible. The word Trinity is, comes from two different words, tri and unity. Putting them together, you get triunity or Trinity. And so, but the New Testament calls, uh, calls it the great Godhead, the Godhead. And I always like to go to the passage of Scripture in 1 John chapter number 5 and verse 7. Put that on the screen. Chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7, it says, There are three, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Now notice it says, and these three are one. These three are one. Amen. So in Acts 10, 38, uh, that verse mentions all three. How God the Father anointed Jesus the Son, and it tells you what he anointed him with, the Holy Ghost, and then and, and something else, and power. Amen. So whatever Jesus did as a result of God anointing him must be the will of God because the anointing is burden removing yoke destroying power to carry out God's assignment in the earth to do what only God can do. Amen. So God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and with power to go and carry out a commission. Amen. Jesus was on a mission. Now, the mission statement of Jesus is primarily, not, not everything summed up in that verse, but it's primarily John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus said, the thief, the devil, cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's the mission statement of the devil. Anything that's stealing from you, killing you, and ultimately destroying you is the work of Satan. That's the work of the thief, the devil. Amen. 
Jesus said, but I am come that you might have life, John 10, 10, and that you might have life more abundantly. I am come that you might have life. Number one, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Number two, Jesus said, but I am come, the reason that I am come, that I might destroy the works of the devil. Now, go to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8 in review. 1 John chapter number 3 and verse 8. Let's look at that verse. He that committed sin is of the devil. That's plain enough, isn't it? He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned it from the beginning. For this cause, or this purpose, King James says, the Son of God was manifest, amen, that he might destroy the works of the devil. To destroy the works of the devil. Amen. Now, the word destroy here, means to paralyze, to break down, to paralyze, to reduce to nothing. Jesus was anointed by the Father, God, amen, who went about doing good. And, and that verse says he went about doing good healing. And so healing must be then destroying the works of the devil. Amen. amen. Because that verse says, God anointed, Acts 10, 30 says how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good and healing. Doing good and healing. Now, a couple of two verses for this purpose, or this cause, was the Son of God manifest to destroy the works of the devil. You see, when you preach and teach healing, you're destroying some of the works of the devil. When you preach and teach the cross of righteousness, you're destroying the works of the devil. When you preach the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you're destroying the works of the devil. When you preach the new covenant and the blessings, you see, when you preach, some people say, well, now, I don't know about that prosperity gospel. There ain't no such of a thing as the prosperity gospel. There may be people who preach on prosperity and then major on that side of it, but no, 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 the gospel's all inclusive. The gospel, the word gospel means good news. The good news that God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. The good news that Jesus died for all of our sins. The good news that Jesus Jesus became sin for us. The good news that Jesus literally died and went to hell. His spirit went down into the lower parts of the earth for us. The good news that God raised him from the dead. The good news that surely he has borne our sicknesses and carried our disease and with his stripes we are healed. The good news that 2 Corinthians 9, 8, 8, 9 uh, says, that 9, 8, it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was exceedingly rich, yet for our sake he became poor, that through his poverty we might be made rich. The gospel covers your spirit, getting the man born again. The gospel covers your body, getting the man healed. The gospel covers your material and financial blessings, getting people blessed in the earth and delivered from the curse of poverty. Say amen if you can. Now, so uh, many Christians uh, tribute what the devil does to God. They attribute that anything the devil, that, see, death, dying, sickness, Disease, murder, crime, rape, people being born or uh, deformed. They ask questions as to why. And many people say, well, God, you know, is behind it all. Well, that must have been the will of God. And some people claim atheism because they say, well, now, if there was a God, well, now, why would he allow all that to happen? Well, the answer to that question is he, he is God, and there is a God. And, and, and if you got in the Word of God, you'll find out that God has nothing at all to do with any evil, any death, any dying, any crime, any murder, any destruction, any sickness and disease, any poverty and like. God has nothing to do with bad farmland in foreign countries that cannot produce healthy agriculture because of drought and pollution of water 
and, and, and people are dying in villages of the world and remote places of the world. They don't have the privilege of electricity as we have here in America. They don't have the privilege of, of clean water as we have here. Amen. And as well as other countries, well, people say, well, that's God's fault. If God is God, why do he let little babies starve to death and die? If God is God, why is there so much death? Well, because people is full of the devil. God never, God never commissioned anybody to rob any bank. God never commissioned anybody to shoot anybody. God never commissioned anybody to slap anybody. God never commissioned any, on any babies born out of wetlock through whatever media, medium. God's not behind any of it. God's not behind the death and killing of babies. God didn't, God's not behind the man who robbed the gas station. God is not behind the man who beat his wife. God is not behind the person that murdered somebody. God's not behind it. See, there's a devil. There's a devil. There is an outlaw fallen spirit named Lucifer that fell from his state of creation and now he has been the, made the God of this world by Adam's transgression in the garden. And he's running the world. I'm going to prove it to you tonight. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, I'm going to show it to you from the word of God. Because most things that we believe, we, heard, we believe them because we heard them, not because we got them out of the Bible. Your belief system was formed by what you heard from a child up. You kept hearing it and it was embedded into your thinking. And if you don't watch it, your belief system is being uh, manipulated and controlled, just turning on the 5 o'clock and 10 o'clock news. Amen. They're trying to, they're not giving news, they're, they're giving a narrative, trying to structure your belief system to go the way of the world. Amen. And sad to say, but a lot of our poor pitchy across America are not preaching the word of God, not scripturally teaching the word of God. There's a lot of entertainment. There's a lot of hoop the, hoop the laws, a lot of hollering, a lot of uh, entertainment, a lot of things done in the name of God, in the name of church. That's literally embarrassment and an abomination and disrespectful to God. So where can we go for the truth? You see, the truth is not the Bible. The Bible contains the truth. The truth is the person. Jesus said, I am truth. I am truth. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. The Bible is a book that contains, it is an inspired, written uh, uh, record or the truth. But the truth is the person of Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And this Bible, this book, amen, 66 books of exceeding great and precious promise, promises. This book is the Holy Scripture that's been inspired by Holy God, by His Holy Child Jesus, and by the Holy Ghost, and watched over by His holy angels, and given to holy men who spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, and it was inscribed or written down. And it's the Scripture. Amen. There's not one verse that contradicts another verse. This Bible was written by over 40 men in a period of over 1,200 years. There are no discrepancies. They had no phones, no fax, no emails, and didn't write to confer, compare notes. And all of them come up with the infallible truth of the Word of God. It's reliable, it's dependable. The Bible says God watches over His Word to keep it or to make it good or to perform it. The Bible says heaven and earth shall pass away before one, one tittle, one dot or tittle, one crossing of the T, a dotting of the I, Heaven and earth will pass away before one dotting of the I, crossing of the T, is passed away from my word. Amen. You can hang your life on the written word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, now somebody say, well, now, but you see, man wrote the Bible. That's an idiotic statement. That's a stupid statement. I don't believe the Bible because man wrote it. Well, you believe the dictionary. You believe the science book. You believe the newspaper article. 
You believe all the other books. Somebody wrote a cookbook and, and, and you follow the instructions. You don't even know uh, Miss Sarah Lee. You don't even know Betty Crocker. You don't even know the person behind the cookbook. But you'll do everything they tell you to do in faith that if I do what they tell me to do, it'll produce this picture. What I'm trying to say is that man, there's no books in the earth on any shelf in any place that has not been written by some person. You see, that's an excuse. People are looking for an excuse not to believe the Bible when they believe every, every other book they read. And the Bible says, holy men of old speck as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Bible says all scriptures given by inspiration of God. That means God breathed. Theo nitros. God's breath and life. Woof. But breathed into the scripture. And men spake as they were moved or blown along by the winds of the spirit. The anointing, the Holy Ghost would come upon them and they would say, thus said the Lord. Isaiah would say, the word of the Lord came. I mean, it wasn't there all the time, but when it came, it was canonized in the scripture. Amen. Now, so let's look at the scripture. Go back to Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Let's look at this verse. Number one, it says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. And the Greek word there, power is dunamis. It means miracle, explosive, working power or ability. The Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good. Now notice this, and healing all. Healing all, not some, but all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with Jesus when he was doing the healing. God anointed Jesus to do the healing. So then sickness is the work of Satan and healing is the work of God through Christ Jesus. Amen. You notice it says doing good, healing all that was oppressed of the devil. So everybody that was sick is under satanic oppression. Sickness is, say, you ever, had a, you ever had a marvelous, glorious, peaceful headache? You ever had a marvelous, glorious disease that was so wonderful and glorious? You ever had a pain that was so wonderfully glorious, you're just hoping it could stay there the whole while? No, 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 there's nothing glorious. There's nothing peaceful. There's nothing wonderful about sickness, not even a headache. You don't even want a headache. We're trying to get rid of a headache. Amen, because it's not the will of God. It's not from heaven. You don't want it. I don't want anything that doesn't come from heaven. Amen. James chapter 1, verse 17 says, Every good and perfect gift coming down from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Every good and perfect gift. Healing's good. Sickness is bad. God is good. Satan is bad. Sickness is Satan's work. Healing is God's work. Anybody that's sick, there's some satanic oppression. Anytime there's healing, that's the presence of God on the scene. God brings healing. Satan brings sickness. He went about doing good, healing all <clears throat> that was oppressed um, the devil. For God was with him. Amen. Now, so then, if that's true, Brother Strada, where does sickness come from? Well, that's a good question. I, I want to show you. Um, I, I want to show you some verses of Scripture that may be very illuminating to you. Now, go to uh, Romans chapter number five. Now, see, I'm out of my notes here. Romans chapter five. I had a thought. By the, given to me by the Spirit, so I'm going to follow that thought. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 5 <clears throat> and verse 12. Romans 5, 12. I notice what it said. It says, wherefore, as by one man. Everybody say one man. One man. Say it loud. Say one man. one man. One man sin entered into the world. Where did sin enter into? The world. And then notice what came with sin, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, amen, for that all have sinned. Now look up at me. When Adam sinned in the garden, the first thing that happened to him was he died spiritually. We call it spiritual death. You remember that? 
that uh, in, um, in Genesis chapter number one, chapter number three, excuse me, Genesis chapter number three, the Bible says that <clears throat> there was a garden planted by God. Now, this is Genesis chapter number two, eastward in Eden. And Eden means the presence of God. It means the place where God met with man. It means pleasure. There was a, a portal or a meeting place that God would come down and meet with his man Adam, and they would walk and talk together as they had a relationship. Adam wasn't the Catholic or Baptist or Pentecostal, amen, or Methodist or Presbyterian or Assemblies of God. Adam, the Bible says he was the son of God. He had a relationship with God. God didn't come to make man religious. He came to give, restore man's relationship back with him. And so God would come down in the, in the cool of the day and talk with his man Adam. They would have communion, fellowship. In fact, God created all the animals. And God uh, saved the creation for man last. On the sixth day, he created man. And a woman wasn't created at this time. She was inside the man. And the Bible says, are y'all listening to me? The Bible said God brought the animals to Adam to see whatsoever he, the man, would call them. And so man had dominion over the earth. When God created him, he says, have dominion over the earth, over the fowls of the air, over the fish of the sea, and over every cattle and beast of the field and every creeping thing that the Lord thy God has made. The word dominion means to conquer, to manage, to subdue, to conquer it, to manage it, to subdue the earth. Well, you might ask the question, who was there on earth to conquer and to subdue? Adam was the first human being on the earth. He wasn't the only being on the earth. He was the first human being on the earth. Amen. Now, you remember the Garden of Eden? Sure you do. <clears throat> and um, God said to Adam, I planted the garden eastward in Eden. And then he said, of all the trees thou mayest freely eat. Could have been hundreds of them. Could have been thousands of them. But there are two trees in the midst of the garden. The tree of life. And then the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eat off the tree of life and you may live forever. You see, Adam had life. Everybody say life. life. But he didn't have the kind of life that you have right now in Christ Jesus. He had life. But he didn't have eternal life. Now you think about eternal from the standpoint of duration. Adam was an eternal being, spirit being, given a soul, his mind, and personality, and will, but put in a physical body so he could have the capacity of operating in two worlds, the physical world and the unseen world. Through his spirit, he could operate in the spirit realm through his authority, and he used his authority to govern the natural realm, the earth. Amen. But you see, his life that he had wasn't... He, wasn't see, when we think about eternal, we think about perpetual existence. But see, actually, the, the, the word eternal in the New Testament, they translated it eternal life. It's actually the Greek word zoe, which means life as God hath it. It means life with no death. It means quality of life. It means the life of God. It means life, perpetual, ongoing, same, peaceful, godly, holy life of God. Amen. And God said, now if you eat of the tree of life, now notice what he said, you'll live forever. You'll live forever. You'll live forever. But if you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. That's Genesis 2.17. Do I have to read all that, or am I quoting it pretty close enough for you to know that it's in there? I, can, I could stop and we could read it. Amen. Now, in the Hebrew text, 
Literally, it says where King James says, the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. The Hebrew text literally says, dying, thou shalt die. The day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, dying, at that point, thou shalt die. Surely not. But if you eat of this tree of the, uh, life, thou shalt live forever. Amen. Well, I think I will. You, you're looking at me wrong. I don't like the way you're looking at me. It's wrong. <laughs> Go to Genesis chapter, chapter number two. We won't prove it to you. Amen. See, I saw somebody wanted to know that. All right, then. Genesis chapter, we're still talking about where the sickness comes from. Genesis <clears throat> chapter number 2 and verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now, uh, somebody said that's how you keep a wife. You dress her, you'll keep her. Uh, that, that's humor, but somebody say it's very little, so we'll move right along. 16 verse says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. I got a little T by the word uh, uh, shall surely die. In my Bible, it means translation. And see, it's translating that from the original Hebrew scripture. It says, dying thou shalt die. And so, look up here at me. Did Adam, uh, and, and we read on that in, in the third chapter of Genesis, the Bible says now there was a serpent. Everybody says serpent. Well, now that's enough. If we just put a period right there, we don't, have, we don't need it, no other description. I don't know, you know, a, a serpent, a snake, a serpent, a reptilian of some kind. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the fear which the Lord thy God has made. And the serpent said to Eve, he came over and started talking to Eve, which he had no business talking to her. Say amen. amen. Now back up with me. Let, me. let me tell you this before I get back to that point. When the Lord planted the garden eastward in Eden, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, the Bible says he, he told the man to keep the way in the garden. To, he put the man in the garden and he told him to keep it. Keep it. And the word keep means protect the garden. Everybody say protect. protect. You see, uh, the order of man is first, a man first doesn't need a wife, he first needs the presence of God. Adam enjoyed the presence of God. He had an assignment from God. He had a relationship with God before he ever had a wife. He had a job description. His job was to subdue the world, have dominion, keep the garden. Don't let any intruders in the garden. Keep the way of the garden. Amen. Don't let anybody in the garden. That's Genesis 2.15. Well, Look up here at me. There was no other human being on the planet. There was no other human being on the planet at that time. But obviously there was somebody or something roaming around in the earth that obviously wanted access or entrance into the garden. Say amen. Why would Adam have to protect the garden from nobody that exists? Just keep the door open. Nobody's coming through it. It's just me. And I got authority over these animals and elephants and giraffes or whatever, and I can set their boundaries. Don't come over here into my garden. Y'all stay out there, so to speak. Because he, he had authority over 
the beast of the field and every creeping thing that creeped upon the cattle. He had authority. His dominion was in his words, from his mouth. And so God and the man would work together. Women, don't ever leave the church house, quote unquote, the presence of God, and go out yonder somewhere in the world looking for a man to get the man and bring him back into the church or the presence of God thinking he's going to do right. He's not going to do right. You can't change a man. Oh, he'll fool you a few weeks till the wedding's over. <laughs> Say amen if you can. Amen. Adam, a man needs God. I need God before I need a wife. I need God before I needed a woman. I need God. I need to hear from God. I need the presence of God. I need an assignment from God. I need instructions of God. Then I need a help meet equal unto me to help me carry out the assignment. Amen. And then I need to tell her everything that God has told me to do, and she needs to honor that, trust that, believe that, because she wasn't there when God was speaking to the man. And God made the man responsible for it. God, see, when Eve ate off of the fruit, nothing happened. There was no authority. Nothing happened. But she gave also to her husband there with her. And after he ate, boom, death set in, the curse set in. Because he had the authority, the God-given authority. But backing up, God said to the man, keep the way of the God. Keep it. Everybody say keep it. Keep it. <clears throat> the word keep means protect it. From who? From who wants to get into this garden? Well, I'll show you. Now, see, I wasn't going this route, but I'm going to take some time and, and, and go this way. Go over to uh, Isaiah. <clears throat> Praise God. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to take the account from Ezekiel chapter 28 first. Go to Ezekiel chapter 28. I'm still talking to you about where does sickness come from. See, because you always thought that it came from God, and it didn't. You thought death came from God, and it didn't. God's not a murderer. God's not a hypocritical parent. God don't tell his children, don't do as I do. I'm going to kill a bunch of them. I'm going to lie. I'm going to kill. I'm going to steal. I'm going I'm to murder them. But don't you do it. God gave the Ten Commandments was the commandments were an expression of what a righteous man would do and how he would live. A righteous man don't steal. He don't lie. He don't covet. He won't kill. A righteous man loves God and loves people. So God, God is not the author of death. I'm, I'm backing up to show you. You see, to say where sickness comes from, you would have to know where death comes from because sickness is death somewhere going to happen. You're all through the Bible. The Bible said Elijah was fallen sick and died. Amen. The Bible says uh, concerning uh, the centurion servant in Luke chapter 7 verse 2 says, And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. The Bible says concerning Lazarus in John chapter 8, Lazarus got sick and died. Usually when people get too sick or sick enough, they what? Die. Because sickness is a manifestation of death. Sickness is death going somewhere to happen. Why do people go to the hospital? Why aren't people in the hospital? Why are they in the intensive care unit? Why are they in the emergency room? Because they are sick and close to death. And if they don't, recover, then they will die. Say amen. amen. So, God told Adam to keep the garden. Everybody say keep the garden. Now, 
there's somebody on the outside that wants to get on the inside and I'm telling you to hedge it about. See, the word keep is a military term to guard. It's the same terminology that after Adam sinned, the Bible said God set cherubims and with flaming seraphims with a cherubim with a flaming sword to keep the, the garden, to protect it. Well, before he set that cherubim there, Adam's job was to keep that garden. Adam's job was to keep his wife, keep that garden. His job was to keep the assignment of God. His job was to manage and, and, and to develop the earth and to keep the earth going in a peaceful harmony. Amen. Because, can I fast forward and tell you something? Because God loves man, his top creation, so much, eventually, heaven moves to earth and God becomes the tabernacle of man. Read the back of the book. When this is all down, all said and done, for I saw a new heaven and a new earth and the holy city descending out of the sky, and it landed on the earth, and there was no more sea, and God had come down to dwell and to live among men. That's what the original plan, and we see it unfolding. Sin delayed it, detoured it, got it off course. Jesus came to redeem man, bring him back in the right relationship with God, set him on the path of righteousness to have strapped to abstract a righteous harvest of believers out of the earth so that God could eventually tabernacle, live among them, with them. Read the back of the book. We win. I've seen the end. Say amen. amen. Now, so, before Adam was created, throughout the eons of times past, this earth was inhabited by other beings. Some theologians believe that there were angels in the angelic class. I don't know. I can't say that for sure. But in Genesis chapter 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then there is an enormous amount of time theologians and Hebrews call it the gap theory, meaning between Genesis 1 and and Genesis 2 is an enormous amount of time, there's an enormous amount of gap in there that was unimportant for God to bother us with all of the minute details. And then Genesis 1, 2 says, and the earth became, or the earth became without form, void, and darkness was upon the faith of the deep. And then the Spirit of God moved Upon the faith of the waters. The word move there in the Hebrew language, it means the Spirit of God hovered or he was grieved over the tragedy of what had happened to the earth. The Spirit of God just hovering over the faith of the deep, just hovering over the earth. Because the earth had become void. The word void means an empty, empty, chaotic, useless wilderness. Amen. Void without form and darkness. The Hebrew word koshak, koshak, it literally means depressed, misery, death, destruction, darkness, wicked, evil. All inclusive. The earth became dark. The Bible says God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Everybody say at all. At all. That's John chapter number, 1 John chapter number 1, verse 5, by the way. Amen. God is light, but the earth became dark. God is light, in him is no dark, but the earth became empty. Well, for something to be empty... It would have once had to be full. Amen. 
If I set a full glass of water here on the podium and I come back in and old brother Wendell here snuck up in the podium and drunk my water, I will come in and say, my glass is empty. What happened to my water? Because the glass was once full. In order to be empty, now if it was always empty, it's just empty. But it was once full to be empty. The earth became empty. It became a chaotic wilderness. Something had happened. Amen. There was an angel. His name was Lucifer. Everybody say Lucifer. Lucifer actually means light bearer. He bared the light in the presence of God. When you read about this magnificent angel of creation, that he was so beautiful, he didn't make music, he was music. He didn't play the saxophone, the clarinet, or the keyboard. He had the pipes, the saxophone, the clarinet, and the keyboard were built inside of him. And he made beautiful sounds of worship and praise in the presence of God, Lucifer. Amen. And one of the highest form of Lucifer, Hallel, Hallelujah, comes out of the word hallow, which means light, to express boldly, to declare, to, to a declaration of what God is. Lucifer obviously was over some kind of praise and some kind of worship. And that's why you see in congregations and churches, nearly all churches stand to fall by the music that's coming out of, their, out of that church. You can look at the music department and the sounds and determine what spirit is operating in that church. I asked the Lord about it. He told me about it. I wrote it down. I hadn't said anything to anybody yet about it. I asked the Lord about the music department in the church. Why is it the way it is? Because at the beginning, it was ran by an angel called Lucifer, a light bearer. Amen. Now, let's look here in Ezekiel chapter number 28. <clears throat> Verse 12, it says, Son of man, take up lamentations upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Doth said the Lord God, Thou seal it up to some, full of wisdom and perfect in being. Stop. Now, the king of Tyrus <clears throat> was uh, not a man. Now, listen to me. In every nation, there was a literal physical man over Tyre that was a king, but behind every king is a principality or power that's ruling that country or nation. The man, if he doesn't know God, he's, under, he's in the dominion of Satan. He's in the world of darkness. And he may think he's running his communistic anti-God, socialistic country himself, but there's a principality, there's a ruling spirit that's behind him that's, that's calling the shot and manipulating the activity of that country. That's why it's important to vote for people that have God in them, that honors God and loves God so they can listen to God. But this is a, this is a principality. Now, do you remember old Daniel? When Daniel was down in uh, down there in uh, in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, modern day uh, Iraq, Babylon, Iraq of that day, Iraq of this day, and uh, Daniel prayed. He wouldn't bow down and worship the image of the of the king, and he prayed, and, and, and he went on a fast. And then there's an angel, Gabriel, Michael, uh, Mike, Gabriel came to him with the answer. Gabriel, this is, a, I'm, I'm, I'm going a direction totally different than, I didn't have this plan, so bear with me. Gabriel was just the chief, he is a, uh, an angel, a chief prince that he's an, over messengers. He brings messengers, messages to the church. He was the angel that came to 
uh, Zechariah and announced the birth of John. He was the angel that came to Mary and said, Hail Mary, thou art, he brings the assignment of God. Now there are other angels under him that bring messages to people in the earth, but Gabriel, I am Gabriel and I stand in the presence of God. For what reason? To hear from God, to hear God's assignment and then carry it and put it in the earth in the ears of men. Well, Gabriel came to Daniel and said, Fear not, O Daniel. He says, From the first day that thou prayed, thy prayers was heard and answered. But the prince of Persia withstood me. The prince of Persia wasn't a man. A man can't stand against Gabriel, an angel. The prince of Persia withstood against me twenty and one days. In fact, I have to call up backup. I called the chief prince Michael. Michael's over the war angels. He's, he's over the angels of hosts, the warring angels. And the chief prince Michael came, backed me up, defeated that prince of Persia, and now I am here for thy words. But he says, I heard you. Your words were heard. See, it don't take God. God don't hear you after the fight's over. God hears the cry of faith when it releases from yes. your mouth. Yes. You'd be right. The battle just started. You may think it, it may be a long process, but God heard you at the beginning. And he says, from the first day, thy prayers were, the first day you prayed, your prayers were heard. But there's a principality over the air that withstood me 20 and one days. And I called for another chief prince, Michael, to help clear the airways. And now I am come. I want to tell you, that you are in spiritual warfare. There's more going on than there is going on. There's more stuff going on behind the scenes than there are things on the scene. Are you listening to me? Elijah was giving prophetic words of knowledge to the king of Israel. And told the king, the Syrian army, they're coming this way and they're going to try to ambush you here and don't go here and then don't go there and then don't go there. And the king of Syria got frustrated. He said, we have a spy in the camp. Somebody is out telling my secrets that I talk about in the privacy of my own generals in my bedchamber. Who's telling off on me? And they say, none of us, my Lord. But at last, there is a prophet over there in Israel, and he knows and hears what you're doing in your bedchamber, and he's telling people where to go and what to do and what not to do. And he said, a prophet, I'm going to kill him. Go get him. He sent out a, 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 an army to go find this Elijah. Go find this Elisha. Go find him. We're going to kill him. Amen. Well, Elisha and one of his servants, they were out there in the, in the middle of nowhere. And, and, and his servant uh, come out one day to, to tend to the, the meal and do his, uh, he was a servant, to do his mournly du duties there. And he looked up on the horizon and, and the Bible said he saw soldiers round about the mountain on every side. I mean, it could have been, now, they came out by the hundreds, could have been thousands of soldiers on every side. And the servant feared and quaked, and he went in to wake up, Elijah, Elijah, my master, my master, wake up, wake up. We're being surrounded by the Syrian army. Elijah was a man of faith. See, men of faith, they can sleep late. Amen. Amen. They went in and woke him up and he, oh, 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 what's going on? Man, master, 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 you, you got to come quick. You gotta, what's going on? We're surrounded. We're surrounded. They're coming to kill us. He said, oh, well, I thought you wanted something. I'm going to go back in and go back to sleep. No, no, he said, it's got to be thousands. Of, now, I'm paraphrasing it, you know. You, you, you've read enough of the Bible to know it's in there. I could stop, turn, read it, word for word. But Elijah said, well, there's more with us than there is against us. He didn't go out to look for the count. He just knew 
the operations of God. There's more with us than there be against us. And the servant said, more with us? Come, come out and look. Look, it's me, you, mules. You know, 100, 200, 300, 400. It's more with us? He says, yes. He said, but Lord, I'm going to, he said, I'm going to pray for you. He said, Lord, open his eyes. And see, that's what I'm saying, that you're in spiritual warfare. There's more happening than you can see. Elijah said, there be more with us than there be against us. He saw the angels. He knew the angels would, no, we're not surrounded. They're surrounded. And the Bible said when the servant opened his eyes, he saw, now here's what he saw, chariots of fire. And horsemen thereof, wound about the mountains, and totally surround the mountain. And then he looked at Elijah with a double look, and he had a circle. He had a, a circle of fiery angels around him on every side. Yes, Lord. Whew, glory to God. Lord. Hallelujah. And then that old servant got in faith. Amen. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Come on, come on. You see, but you see, he had to see it to believe it. Elijah believed it and didn't have to see it. And therefore, Jesus said in the New Testament, he said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But yea, rather more blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. And Jesus said in John the 11th chapter, the 40th verse, he says, Say I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, you would see the glory. Some people will say, well, show me the glory and then I'll believe. Jesus said, believe and then you'll see it. They say, show me the glory and I'll believe. Jesus said, believe and you'll see it. Amen. And people that are waiting to see something, you know what they're doing? They're still waiting to see something. People that's believing is seeing something. Somebody say, seeing is believing. No, no, believing is seeing. Amen. Believing is knowing. Amen. The Bible says faith is the evidence of things not seen. Or heard. Amen. Now, so that's the point I was making that this prince is not just a man, this king, he is a spirit being. Now, let's go back to Ezekiel. <clears throat> For you rudely interrupted me. Now, Ezekiel chapter 28, he's talking about, verse 12, the king of Tyrus. He says, thou seal it up to some full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now, that ain't, I ain't never seen no man perfect in beauty. I've seen some women pretty much close to it, my wife, but uh, no man. Let's look at verse 13. Now, he's talking about this created being. Thou has been in, thou has been in, Come on, you that's watching online, thou has been in Eden, the garden of God. This created being that he's addressing, you has been, you're not now, you have been in Eden, the garden of God. Precious, every precious stone was in thy covering. The sulfire, the sapphire, the topaz, and the diamond, and the beryl, and the onyx, and the jasper, and the sapphire, and the emerald, and the carbuncle, and the gold, the workmanships of thy tabards, and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. The Bible never calls men created. Adam was the only man created because he was the first one. After Adam, the, all other men were born. Amen. So this being that he's talking about has some kind of spiritual, has the covering. Now, now look up at let me. Let me show you how you, let me show you how something, you have to understand the Bible. When people get rich and wealthy and famous and People go to these uh, awards like the Oscar and, 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 and you know, and different kinds of uh, uh, awards and elite society. And they got the red carpet and the limousines and, the, and the, the photographers, the paparazzi and all that stuff, all that. And you notice that people go out and buy clothes with diamonds in them, dresses, pearls, rubies, sapphires, diamonds. And they like glitter and gleam and bling bling. And they do that for a covering because they think that that will make them more 
glorious, more beautiful, more, more appealing, more, more fabulous. <clears throat> I read of a, a particular star, a rapper, star, female, that uh, the, the, the headlines was talking about uh, how much her, her bikini was, string bikini, that showed a picture of it. It was, it was, it was somewhere like $50,000 plus dollars for a two-piece bikini piece that didn't cover much at all. But what made it so fabulous and what made it so spectacular that the newspaper, that the people decided to write about it, was that the part that was covering her privates were made of diamonds. Now, people get mad at preachers for buying airplanes to fly to countries and preach free and distribute food, clothing, and preach the gospel. But it's okay for a movie star, a celebrity, to pay $50,000 for a two-piece bikini. That's vain. Amen? See, that, see, now, this being was covered with that. He fell from that. And from that, he's seeking to get that covering of glory back. This being had all of that built in its covering. Now let's look at verse 14. <clears throat> Thou art the anointed cherub. So now we know this is not a man, it's an angelic being, a cherub, in one of the orders of creation. Thou art the anointed cherub, thy covering, thy co that coverage, excuse me. And I have set thee so, thou was upon the what? Holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways and, y'all still follow me? Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Stop right there. That's a reference to a creative cherub whose name was Lucifer that fell from glory. Now, you remember that verse of scripture that we read at the beginning in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it says, He that sinned is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this cause was the Son of God manifested to destroy, or this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. The devil sinned from the beginning. Now, this angel, original position, was not just heaven. It wasn't, Lucifer was not just in heaven. You see, the thing, the way that things are now is not the way that they was. I mean, this earth is not even the way that it was pre norse flood and then the flood before that. There were ge geographical changes in the land structure. The, there was a canopy around the earth uh, that surrounded the earth that sealed in the, the oxygen of the earth to a higher density, that's why everything grew so large. Animals, plants, trees. The earth is different now. The earth is in a fallen state. It's not the way God originally created it. Well, <coughs> well, Lucifer's position, now listen to me, he was in the original garden of God or Eden. Thou was in Eden, the garden of God. You walked up and down on the stones of fire. You were somehow in God's presence. You were somehow in charge of bringing people into God's presence or bringing beings into God's presence. 
Now, it says that I'll cast you out of the mountain. He was in the mountain of God. These positions that's being described in Ezekiel chapter 28 are earthly positions. Lucifer had a kingdom in the earth. He ruled from the mountain of God over some beings that were residing here on the planet. And he obviously corrupted himself and corrupted everything that he was over. Go to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah. I'm talking about where does sickness come from. And I'm, I'm using our verse of scripture. Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that was oppressed of the devil. According to that verse, sickness is satanic oppression. Isaiah chapter, chapter 14, excuse me. Isaiah chapter 14. <clears throat> I don't have notes in front of me for this. How many, how many believe what I'm saying tonight? How many see this in scripture? Okay, Isaiah chapter 14. <clears throat> now, verse 11. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave. The word grave here is shoal, hell. And the noise of thy vows, or lutes or flutes, the worm is spread under thee, and the worm covereth thee. Now, hell was not created for man. God loved man. But God gave the first man freedom of choice. And he gave everybody freedom of choice. And whosoever God you choose to serve, you have to receive the judgment of that God. Lucifer rebelled against the order of God, and God prepared a place, a prison called Sheol, Hell, Hades. And anybody that chooses to serve this God, this false God, he has to receive the judgment of this God. When you serve God, when you serve God, you receive God's judgment. God judged me and you in Jesus. He put the whole world. See, God is righteous and holy, and sin dictates a righteous judgment. God had to judge sin righteously, or God wouldn't be just and fair. God, before he is anything else, he's holy and just. There's no wrong in God. He's never made a bad choice or a bad decision. He's never made a mistake. God never says, our, uh, uh, God never says, hmm, let me see. God never says, hmm, I don't know. God never said, wait, let me ask somebody. He only takes counsel with himself. The Bible says, who at any time has given him any advice? Who can tell God anything that he doesn't know? Who can tell God what's good? God is the epitome of good, light, righteousness, truth, holiness. God is absolute fire, light, truth, love, righteousness, holiness. He's absolutely everything good. He is the absolute. Amen. Now, hallelujah. So hell was created. It didn't always exist. Can I back up and go one more with you? Heaven was created. It hadn't always exist. The only thing that the Bible gives reference to always existing is God. And the Bible says in the beginning, God. Not at the beginning. In the beginning, as far David, God allowed David to look into the spirit realm. I'll show you what it looked like. God allowed David to look into the spirit realm. And David looked over. He said, thy mercies and thy glories are from Ever, 4,000 years, a million years, a billion years, 10 billion. No, no, no. Your mercies and glories are from everlasting to. Let me look over here and see, does it stop? Everlasting. That's the best I can do with it. 
So this stuff called life, they, Jesus made up that word when he was on the earth. He that have the son have life for the same life that is in the father was in the life. We didn't have no definition for it. So they translated it e eternal. And what they're trying to say, life the way God has it, God always was, always will be, the life of God, eternal life, everlasting life, the God kind of life. The, the, the Amplified Bible says in Philippians chapter 1, the stuff that makes God God. <laughs> Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Jesus said, whosoever have, have the Son, acknowledges the Son, have life. The same life that the Father has is in him. I am come that you might have life, and that you may have this kind of life eternally, in abundance, in full, until it overflows. Amen. So, God, in the beginning, God created the heavens, plural, and the earth. Different regions, different compartments of the heavens. At least, the Bible talks about at least three. The Hebrews teach that there are seven. And then they're called stellar heavens, the layers of the atmosphere of heavens. The Bible said the heavens of heavens even declare his glory. Yeah. There are heavens that you can't see yet. Yeah. There are heavens that are reserved that he might show unto us the exceedingly riches of his glory. Yes. The strongest telescope in the world can only see a fragmentary part of the universe. They thought they had it all figured out, created a better, bigger telescope and twisted that thing and turned it a little bit on its axis and found 10 billion other galaxies. We didn't know that was out there. And one day we get to play around out there. God always was, God always will be. God is always eternally the same. He's not I was, he's not I will be, he is I am. I am who? I am anything that you need me to be at the time you need me to be that I am that all the time. I'm not provision because you got in trouble. I was provision for you got in trouble. It's just when you needed, you called on me and I became provision for you. I'm not just healer when you're sick. I'm healing all the time. It's just when you call on me, Jehovah Rapha, then my healing is manifest unto the needy one. But I am. Moses said, who, if I go back, whom shall I say sent me? God said, tell him I am. Amen. Excuse me, sir. I am who? He says, I am. Amen. What else? He said, that I am. Amen. That I am. Amen. That I am. I got you. He went down there with the message. I am sent me. <laughs> Hallelujah. I am what? Anything that I need him to be. If you don't, you don't let him go, I'm going to show you what he is. I am. I am gave me this stick. I am gave me this rod. I'm happy whether you know it or not. And you ain't even helping me much tonight. I can be happy all by myself. And you won't even say a good amen. amen. Say amen if you amen. can. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Look at, let's look at this, this Lucifer, this fallen angel. How art thou fallen? Look at verse 12. Now here's where you got mixed up at. How art thou fallen from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning. Stop right there and go to Genesis chapter 1. You see, Paul said in 2 Corinthians, I believe 11 chapter. Y'all mind me preach a little bit, teach a little bit? Say amen. amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul said, I knew a man in Christ. 
whether in the body, out in the body, I don't know, God know it. He said, I've had so many revelations in mind, God, I wasn't asleep. He said, if I was gone, he said, some of them feel like I was actually gone. And some of them you actually are in the spirit realm. You, you go in the spirit in those places, in the heaven, in different places. When Paul said, were they in the body, out of the body, I don't know, God know it. He said, such a one was caught up into the third heavens. Say amen. amen. You see, the first heaven is from the ground up to the clouds or what the Hebrews call the mountaintop. From the mountaintop down. You know, some mountains are high, so high they go up in the clouds. Amen. That's the first level of heaven. And then the second level is above the clouds and out into what we call space. And then the third heaven is the heaven of heavens where God's throne is and where he is. Now, there are at least three levels, and I, and I believe to be more, and the, the Hebrews believe to be more. But you see right here, it says, O Lucifer, how are they fallen? Now, look at Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse... Uh, <clears throat> verse 5. <clears throat> well, let's look at... <clears throat> excuse me. Verse... Uh, skip down to verse 6. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. You see that? And let it divide the waters from the... See, the waters covered the earth. Now look, look up at me. Stop. Look up here at me. The first flood was not the flood of Noah. The flood of Noah is the second flood. The flood of Noah came in Genesis 6. This flood came before the creation of man. Amen. And, and uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without board. With, without form and void, darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. God said, let there be light. Or the Hebrew said, light be. And light was. And God separated the light from the darkness. And he called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning was the first day. It took one day to get the light. <laughs> 186,000 miles a second, light came out of God's mouth, penetrated the darkness, separated the darkness, put the darkness in reserve over here, and the light started creating and prevailing. There is no creation without light. Light is the raw material of all matter. Are you listening to me? Now, the next day, <clears throat> in verse 6, and God said, let there be a firmament, in the midst of the waters, and he divided the waters from the waters. Verse 7. And God made a firmament, which is a vast expansion of space. God made the firmament and divided. Y'all following me? He divided the waters which were under the firmament. And it was so. He divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. He divided the waters from the what? Waters. Isn't that what the Bible said? Put it back up there. You didn't get it. I want you to see it. <clears throat> verse. Uh, let's go back up to verse five. And God called the light day and the darkness. He called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. Verse six. And God said, let there be a, div a, a division, a firmament, a vast expansion. Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Simply by, now what divided the waters? God said it, and the waters, the angels of creation started to move and divide it. There was waters from the ground up to the heavens. And God spoke his word, and his word penetrated the waters and created a divisionary line. And the waters, some of the waters began to go up, and the other waters began to recede downward. And the space in the middle, he called it something. Now, this, this is not a theologian. This is God. Now, let's look in the Bible. <clears throat> And God, verse 7, God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament what? He called it what? 
and the evening and the morning was the first day. The space between the waters was the heavens. Are you listening to me? See, see, that's how, see, uh, there, there, there are laws that govern Bible interpretation, and there are certain things that you need to know that interpret all the other things you don't know. One of the things you need to, to define heaven. See, you run into scriptures like this, and Elijah was called away into the heavens. And you say, well, he went to heaven. It didn't say he went to heaven, say he was called away into the heavens. The atmosphere, the atmospheric heavens. Amen. And that's why the Bible says, see, see, everything you read in the Old Testament, wonderful. But you come along Jesus in John chapter 3, he says, no man has ascended up at any time. That settled that. And then you read the Bible, you say, well, Lucifer was in heaven. He got kicked out of heaven. The Bible never said he got kicked out of heaven. You said he got kicked out of heaven because some, you heard somebody else say he got kicked out of heaven. The Bible says he was in the Eden, the garden of God. Say amen. amen. Can I finish this? Are you still out there? Go back to Isaiah chapter 14. Shake yourself now. Shake yourself. Shake yourself and wake yourself up. Praise God. I'm putting a little extra time because we're going somewhere different. It's going to require a foundational, comprehensive knowledge of the Word of God that can't be shaken by today's philosophy and ideologies, science, theology, and religion. The world is trying to steal your God. The generation that's coming up now this generation doubts God more than the generation did when you was a child. They're trying to educate through secular humanism. They're trying to educate creation and God, morals and values. And, and people today say there are no absolute. They, they, they do what they call situational ethics. There are no absolute. See, they don't want God. See, for there to be a God, there had to be an absolute moral right. If, there's, if, there's, if anything's wrong, there has to be something to determine the wrong that's wrong, and it has to be right. If there's no God, we can't have no court systems. If there's no God, we can't have no judges, because right is only right in the eyes of whoever is committing whatever they're doing. No other man has the right to say what's right and what's wrong if there's no morally right and no morally wrong. If there's no absolutes, then there's no wrong. If there is no... If there is sin, <clears throat> what determines sin? Because there was righteousness. All have sinned and fallen. There had to have been righteousness before there was sin. The Bible said where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. What, what the devil did in Adam was not more grand and glorious than what God did in Christ. Amen. Say amen. amen. All right, let's, let's look at this verse in Isaiah. You look at me like... I done came to dinner and you didn't invite me or cook enough. You look like I done showed up at your house and to get your eggs. And you, and, and you, you know it's polite and righteous to I say, Pastor, do you want some? But you, you know you only cooked a, a pork chop enough for you. That's, that's how you're looking at me like, he finna, he fixed to eat my dinner. Say amen. All right, Isaiah chapter 14. Now look at this, verse 12. O Lucifer, how art thou fallen from where? Heaven. But now watch, let's read. Let the Bible interpret itself. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cast, what, down to the what? Ground. The word ground means dry earth. Which did weaken the, the what? Nations. That means there was... Something strong on the earth before it could become weakened. Thou did weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart. Now notice this. I will what? Ascend where? Into heaven. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. If it's already 
up there, why would he have to ascend? The word ascend means to go upward, to relocate his position. See, it didn't say he was in heaven. It said, he had, thou hast fallen from the heavens. He was in the earth. Ezekiel said he was in the garden of God. Ezekiel said he was in the garden of Eden. Ezekiel said he was in the, on the mountain of God on the side of the north. But he got dissatisfied and thought that because he was so good looking, so brilliant, he was so talented, he thought that God had made a mistake in his position and he had iniquity in his heart and he saw something that God didn't create him to have and he desired it against the will of God unrighteously. That's why it's very dangerous to pollute yourself into another man's office. You see something that you think that is flashy and that is very uh, dramatizing and very popular like the office of the apostle and prophet and you assume positions on yourself that God didn't give you. That's rebellion and the Bible has a term for that called this incontent. You're, you're not satisfied. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18 says, God has placed the members in the body, every one of them, as it has pleased him. And what you're saying is, I'm not pleased with what God decided, so I'm going to promote myself. I'm going to exalt myself. I'm going to advance myself. That's the original sin. Now notice what it said, I will ascend into the heavens. I will ascend into heaven, heaven. I will exalt my what? So he had a what? Above, so evidently wherever his throne was, it wasn't where he wanted it to be. It wasn't above. So the opposite of above is beneath. If I'm trying to go above something, that I would have to start from the position of beneath the place where I'm trying to ascend. I'm teaching better than you shout. I will exalt my throne. You can't rule yourself. To have a throne, a king is not a king by himself. He needs to have a kingdom. He has to have a kingdom is the parameterial dimension of the king's authority. It's called his dominion, the king's dominion. And Lucifer had some beings or some, some angelic beings under him, and he had a throne in the mountain of God, and he wanted to ascend up. Are you still here? Yes, sir. All right. I will... Notice this, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Now stop right there. That's the law of double reference. This, that verse, that statement has a dual meaning. Number one, the stars of God in the Bible is Benai Elohim, stars of God. I mean, it, it, could, it, it, it could mean angels in this context. I will exalt my throne above the other angels of God. Or literally, it can literally, physically mean the stars that are in the heavens. I will exalt my kingdom that's down here on the earth. I'm going to ascend up into heaven and I'm going to exalt my throne above the stars of God, meaning I'm under that. Say amen. Stars of God. Amen. Look at the next part of that verse. I will sit upon the mountain of the congregation in the sides of the north. I want to I want to I want to exalt my congregation. I want to exalt my authority. Now look at verse 14. I Five times, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne, I will sit upon the mountain of the congregation of the signs of the north. In verse 14, now, I will ascend above the heights of the what? So he had to have been under that. Wherever he was trying to go, he started below that. 
What I'm trying to tell you is that I said originally when God created Adam and he, now notice, let, let, me, let, me, let me tie up something real quickly because of time. When God created man, if you study what he did when he created him, in Psalm 8 it says, he created man and set him over all the works of his hand. Didn't the Bible say that? The Bible says, crowned him with glory and honor and set him over all the works of his hand. Psalm 8 started by saying, O Lord, thy Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy hand, the moon and the stars, what is man that thou hast art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou wouldst come out of heaven and visit with them? For thou hast, thou hast crowned, thou hast made him a little lower than, and that the, the, the King James translates it, a little lower than the angels. The Greek text says he's made him a little lower than Elohim, which is the Hebrew term for God. God created man a little lower in his own image, in his own likeness, and God gave man a dominion called the earth and told him to be king, to be lord, to keep the earth. I'm going to take care of the heavenlies. I created you to rule in the reign, to be like me, love like me, talk like me. You're my creation in my image, in my likeness, and I'm going to give you your own place of dominion. And I'm going to plant a garden called Eden, and I'm going to come down and commune, fellowship, walk with, talk with, in the cool of the day, the breeze of God. I'm going to come down in the ruach of my spirit, and I'm going to, I'm going to talk with you and give you instructions there. But now you keep the way of the garden and don't let anybody in the garden. Ain't nobody else out there, but there was somebody who once was in the garden. That's jealous, mad, and angry because he saw God create something that was obviously better than him because that looks just like him. I'm beautiful and I'm good looking, but I wasn't satisfied. But he created something. The Bible said, for one in a certain place testifies, saying, what is man? When God created man, there wasn't a crowd of people standing around watching. See how this going to come out. They didn't call the police, the avalanche, or the fire truck of the crowd. It wasn't a crowd of people standing around watching. There wasn't nobody there. But obviously there was a heavenly audience somewhere, some kind of beings or spirit watching and saying, what is he doing now? He's, re he's duplicating himself. He's creating something in his, that looks like him. He put life, breathed into this shell of a man put a spirit in him and gave him dominion and then he crowned him with a covering with, with light the light wasn't in him but the light was around him it was his covering somebody once had that light called Lucifer Somebody once had the anointing called the anointed cherub. Somebody once was in the garden of God, the Eden, the mountain of God, it's called Lucifer. Some, someone, somebody once was responsible for giving God praise and honor and glory. But now some other being called man has taken my place. Now he has the anointing. Now he has the glory. Now he has the honor. Now he has the wisdom. Now he's called to worship God. And I'm mad and angry and envy and full of strife and division. And the Bible said, where there is envy and strife, there is evil in every evil work. Yes. Yes. God said, keep him out of that garden. Don't you let him in that garden. Because he was once there and he wants back in. But I put you in there. And God said, I'm not going to keep him out there for you. You have authority over him. Well, let's read the rest of this verse. I want you to see something here. Verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down. To hell, boom, at my words, hell was created. Yet you shall be brought down to hell, to the side of the pit, that they shall narrowly look upon, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake the kingdoms? 
that that made the world as a wilderness. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth became void, darkness, and without form. Thou hast made the world a wilderness, and hast destroyed the city thereof, that openeth not the house of, thy, of his prisoners. Say amen. Okay. So, when Adam sinned, he died spiritually. He obeyed, disobeyed God. He really didn't, he, he obeyed his wife at the expense of his own spiritual judgment. And so if you think a woman don't have influence on a man, you're hopelessly deceived. A woman can lead a man into the obedience of God or persuade him to go away from God. Ask Solomon. He did everything God told him to do, but he brought in strange wives, and they brought their gods, and they, they got Solomon off of the right path. Somebody says, well, why does the devil use a woman? Well, the first one worked. Ain't no sense in recreating the... Ain't no sense in reinventing the wheel. The first woman got that one, and the second woman, and the third woman, and the fourth woman, and the fifth woman. A lot of strong preachers. One of the strongest preachers I know of was Samson. And a woman got it. One of the greatest kings in the Bible was David. And he yielded to a woman. The devil says the first one worked. So he kept using that pattern. Are y'all still out there? Well, I, I, I'm done. I'm not finished here. But, but uh, I'm done. Now give me, give me, will you give me three minutes? Y'all give me three minutes? Would you give me three minutes? Would you give me three? Would you give me three minutes, sir? Three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen, twenty-one, twenty-four, twenty-seven, thirty. All right, somebody took their three minutes back. And, no, I'm kidding. Let me quote this and I'm done. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse four says, Satan is the God of this world. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, we're going to pick it up here next week. It says, for we fight, wrath not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high or heavenly places. That's who we're fighting against. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 30, the night he was betrayed, he says, Behold, the prince of this world cometh. He didn't say, Behold, Judas and the, Judas and the, and the soldiers are coming. Judas and, the, and the, Judas and the Roman soldiers are coming. No, he said, The prince of this world is coming. Yeah. They were motivated. Judas was motivated by the devil. In the 13th chapter of John, the Bible says, And Satan entered into Judas. And Jesus said, Now, Judas, go do what you'll do, and do yes. thou quickly. And the Bible says, And Judas left, and Satan entered into him and left the room. Say amen. amen. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 says, The whole world lied in wickedness. The whole world lied in wickedness. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8 says, If the princes of this world would have known that God was going to raise Jesus from the dead, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Amen. Satan is the God of this world. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, as Paul said, Where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. The word prince means ruling magistrate. It's the Greek word akon. It means ruling magistrate, chief magistrate. The devil is a ruling prince. And the Bible says, he says, anyone that doesn't walk with God, you're walking according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now working in the children of disobedience. Jesus said, love not the world, neither the Bible says in 1 John 2, 15, don't love the world. Neither the things that are in the world. 
The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life shall perish with the using, but whosoever do the will of the Lord shall abide forever. Can you say amen? amen. Jesus said in John 16, 33, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I beat it. I've overcome the world. Satan is the God of this world. Can you say amen? amen. The Bible says, whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that doeth our faith. Our faith. Isaiah 60, 1 says, Darkness shall cover the earth. We see that in Genesis. And then gross darkness to people. But arise and shine, for we're the people of the light. For thy light has come. Say amen. amen. And all through the Bible, Revelation 12, 7 says, Satan, that old serpent, the dragon, the devil, deceiveth the whole world. He's called the God of this world. He's come to steal. He's come to kill. And he's come to destroy. He's the one that's bringing the cancer. He's the one that's causing the murder and the crime and the rape. The Bible says through one man's sin, one man's disobedience, Adam's sin entered and then death came in by sin so that now death has passed upon all men. There's no such thing as there is a time. The Bible never teaches there's a time to die for everybody. There's not an appointed day for everybody to die. There's more scriptures in the Bible that tell you things you can do to live long. Number one, honor your mother and father and your days will be long and not be cut out. Your lamp won't be put out early. The reason we have a lot of young people dying today is because there's no honor to their parents. And the problem is in many cases there is no parents. And they're dying, 15, 16. Children are shooting, killing each other. Amen. Their days are being cut short. Their lamps are being blown out. That's the devil. That's not God. And so my mission and our mission is to expose the works of Satan, to teach, to preach the word of God, to reveal the truth of God. He that sinned it is of the devil, for the devil sinned it from the beginning. For this cause, the purpose was the Son of God manifested to teach, to preach, and heal all manner of sickness and disease and destroy the works of the devil. Sickness came in as a result of man's fall in the garden. It's a curse that plagues Mankind. If you read in the Bible, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, it lists every sickness that is upon this earth and it calls it a curse. And then it says, and more besides, those diseases that are not listed here shall come upon them that are disobedient, that do not serve the Lord thy God with joyfulness and cheerfulness. The curse is out there. Jesus came to redeem us from the curse. You learn something tonight? Did you learn something? Yes, Praise God. This message has been a blessing to you. We strongly encourage you to support the work of God. If you've heard this, obviously you're interested. Put your money, put your offerings, put your income in God's hand. There's trouble sometimes, there's troublesome days coming ahead, for you know not what tomorrow shall bring in this uncertain world, but the word of God abides forever. Give, and it shall be given back unto you. In Jesus' name. Amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm done. Well,